welcome all to a very special episode of our Wellbeing at Work podcast series. I'm so very pleased today to be discussing employee engagement with none other than Dr. Brian Palmer, the Associate Medical Director at Health Partners. Dr. Palmer received his medical degree from Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine and completed his residency at Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Hospital. He has been in practice now for more than 15 whole years. Now, a little bit about Health Partners, which was founded in 1957. Health Partners is an integrated healthcare organization that provides healthcare services, health plan financing, and administration. It is the largest consumer-governed nonprofit healthcare organization in the United States, serving more than 1.8 million medical and dental health plan members nationwide. The organization's care system includes a multi-specialty group practice of more than 1,800 physicians that now serve more than 1.2 million patients. Dr. Palmer, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thanks so much for the invitation to be here, especially on World Mental Health Day. What a great day to think about the psychological safety and employee engagement in our workforce. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It is our absolute pleasure. And to start, I I wanted to start off by discussing what employee engagement is. How do you define it in your words? Employee engagement is an emotional connection, um, a commitment to the work. And it's an experience of being connected to and cared for at your organization and inspired to go above and beyond to help achieve the mission, in part because the company's mission is also your mission. The organization's success and your success are bound together, and it's more than a job. Work becomes a calling. I remember in my own case, an example of this, when I interviewed for medical school um, a long time ago, the dean sat down in the waiting room with three of us who were between interviews, and he he said to the, the three of us, I'll never forget this, he said, the only reason to go into medicine is to devote your life to the service of humankind. I've thought about that a lot. I, I don't think there's a better reason. I think that probably is a true statement. But I felt that for 25 years. And working in healthcare on the days when we are all at our best and the barriers are removed and we can really um, live out our mission, we get to live out a special mission, um, as we say at Health Partners, to improve health and well-being in partnership with our members, patients, and community. That work motivates me. It feels engaging. That's amazing. Thank you very much for that. And I would love to hear from your experience. And you already started sharing um, in what you have lived through. What are the key contributing factors to employee engagement? You know, at, at Health Partners, we use WTW as our engagement measurement partner, and, and we use their sustainable engagement framework. Sustainable engagement, I think of as kind of the three E's. First, engaged, and I, I was talking about that briefly earlier. There's a belief in the, the company goals, its mission. There's an emotional connection. There's inspiration to go above and beyond to support success, and people feel welcome, included, and valued. The second E is enabled, and this has in part to do with the external factors at work, where we're free from obstacles to success, we have necessary resources, we feel like we can navigate challenges that come our way. And third is an energy, um, feeling energized, and that we have the ability to sustain the energy that we need at work, that the team environment is healthy and supportive, and that we can feel recognized um, or accomplished in our work. That together kind of captures the the goal of what I think of as really driving the you know highest experience of employee engagement. Mm-hmm. I fully agree with that. And uh, today's workforces are, of course, very diverse. Uh, we do have a generation that's just starting out in the workplace, and these uh, this generation is working alongside those who have been in the workforce for decades. How do you begin to tailor engagement strategies such as those three E's to different generations or to diverse employees? Yeah, I I love this question. I'll probably have a lot to to say about it. Um, Our workforces are diverse, and this is true in, as you mentioned, age and generational style, and it's true in dozens of other ways. 
And I, I always think when something's as complex as that, we've just go back to first principles. And one of the, the values we have at Health Partners, one of our four core values is compassion. And within that, we attempt to seek and seek to understand and seek curious and actively listen. We teach each other that and we really, um, try to live that out. And I think leaders play a huge role in ensuring that their team members can feel heard and feel seen and that differences are genuinely embraced. Your question was, how do we tailor in engagement strategies? So if we think about how we, you know, to tailor something, we need to be able to measure and improve. So like many organizations, we have an annual engagement survey and all of our leaders with five or more respondents receive a report that can inform tailored engagement strategies. We can disaggregate by, say, generation, as your example suggests, to understand trends and we can understand variances. I will note in our case, we, we didn't see much statistically different in the last survey across items for generation. What we did learn in our organization, and I know each organization is a little different, but in our organization, I found really interesting. One of our main drivers of engagement was a sense of belonging where people feel connected to their team and would stay at health partners, even if they had opportunities elsewhere. That was what seemed to be a driver in our case. So, Tailored strategies then involve leader capacity to build inclusion, which fuels belonging. So we have an inclusive leader series where we help equip leaders um, to have those intentional and, and curious conversations. Uh, four hours of training where people can learn things like how to mess up better and embrace conflict. And a, a concept I really like called holding, which involves opening up space to think and feel and be without having to do something immediately to fix it, helping people feel safer and safer speaking up and being themselves. We've got leadership development and well-being teams that have create, created a lead well, be well series of courses that help build skills to navigate change, manage stress, and other real issues. And our teams have weekly huddles that they can learn about organizational messages, um, have regular promotion of resources and messages from our CEO uh, with examples of people living out our values and, and more. I think all of those strategies can really help together um, support the goal of particularly in a diverse workforce driving employee engagement. Last, and I, I think of this in part because you and I came to know each other through the EAP work, I think EAP has a particular importance here, that there's an opportunity to improve psychological safety for employees by offering that confidential support and resources that help people feel safe, supported valued in their workplace, knowing that there's a safe space to discuss problems without fear of repercussions fosters that psychological safety. And by offering some at least basic mental health services like supportive counseling and stress management and crisis intervention, there's stigma reduction that occurs around mental health in the workplace. When employees feel that their well-being is prioritized, then they're more likely to be able to speak up and share concerns. So at least those those tactics this, um, taken all together, the idea that we can have internal messaging, we can have measurement, we can have improvement opportunities, we can have tailored leader development, all of those together are ways we drive um, what ultimately is a pretty high level of workplace engagement. Thank you very much for sharing that. So what's resonating with me, what I'm hearing is it, to create strong employee engagement, we require to nurture the engagement, whether that is by training leaders, training teams, being present, creating that sense of belonging. And you also mentioned a very, very important topic, one that I particularly hold uh, close to heart, and that is psychological safety. Um, and I would love if you would be able to elaborate more on how does psychological safety have an impact on employee engagement? Yeah, I, it's near and dear to my heart, too, especially as a psychiatrist. I think a lot about um, when it's present and when it's absent and what the effective effect is. So just taking a step back, psychological safety is a, a shared shared belief and a shared experience that the environment is welcoming for people to take risks, to be vulnerable, that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to speak up and be honest. When present, that can contribute to 
broader engagement. People feel enabled, energized, engaged, our three E's. When it's not present, and I have seen both sides of this in, in my career working in four different um, healthcare organizations, there can be a pretty pervasive impact on overall employee engagement, and it lessens people's experience of feeling energized. It impacts mental well-being and mental health, the connection to the company, and more. And in psychological safety is inextricable from the inclusion work we were talking about in the last question, that people who know and feel that they can be themselves at work they're more energized. They're more likely to speak up. The organization benefits from the broadest possible range of ideas, which we know drives better outcomes. So I think psychological safety is an idea that we talk about a lot, and I know we'll, we'll spend some more time with this, but I think we have to anchor it in the experience of feeling connected, feeling understood, and it really does reflect our, our mission to be an inclusive workplace where people can feel like they belong. Thank you very much for sharing. And that, that is fantastic insight. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit more about EAP. You did talk about the EAP's role in psychological safety and employee engagement. Uh, but could you tell me more about other tools and strategies that can be utilized to measure psychological safety and that impact that uh, we discussed on engagement? Sure. And so, and we'll we can circle back to the EAP part of it, but on the, on the measurement side, measures can come from a, a range of ways. I mean, there are specific questions we can embed in engagement surveys or pulse surveys or health assessments. We're exploring internally some specific focused 30, 60, 90 day um, engagement um, conversations, particularly for team members who are historically at risk for feeling less safe in a workplace so that when they join health partners, there's an intentional um, level of support. One example I've been surprised by and um, have enjoyed is we, like many um, organizations, have a, a training every year on our code of conduct, and each colleague at Health Partners is invited to assess their knowledge of the code, their commitment to uphold the code, and importantly, their perceived safety in speaking up and reporting concerns. And one of the Health Partners traditions, which I, our leader supports our compliance um, functions, has instituted is this great tradition that the training ends with an invitation to actually make a report, to speak up. Um, a what better message to send from senior leadership to the entire organization of we are building a safe culture where people can speak up. It's even, it's important in any culture. It can be life and death in healthcare. We want people to be able to speak up um, all the time. Um, that's essential. I, I think when I round in the hospital, I'll sometimes say to the nurses, best thing you can do today is disagree with me. You know, I want that. That's how we all get better. And that's how I can learn and see something that's not being seen. We want to build that culture. I think just regardless of what tool we use to measure it, and there, there are many, I think one of the reasons it's sometimes a little bit elusive measurement wise is that psychological safety isn't actually a yes, no kind of phenomenon. It really is a team and an individual and an organizational journey to be more fully authentic, more open, more committed to speaking up, sharing ideas, asking questions, understanding others, bringing other people in, lifting other voices up, elevating other perspectives and experiences, seeking out, constantly seeking out diverse input. I think when, when the journey is about getting better and better at that, People feel safe growing in their own leadership when they can think, well, I, I sometimes I really do a great job of seeking out opinions, but sometimes I cut to my usual well-worn pathway of getting something done. Ah, that's a great opportunity to continue to grow as a leader and to learn. And I think that's as important as um, how we how we do the specific measurement of it. Very insightful. I I do have to say, I absolutely love the tradition of inviting people to speak up. I did not know that about your organization before, and it sounds wonderful. Now, I do have one more question for you, Dr. Palmer. As a, as a thought leader and a leader within your organization, 
What advice would you give other leaders who are trying to improve on the psychological safety in their teams and are also looking to improve and focus on boosting engagement? Yeah. And this, you may, you're expecting me to talk about some specific um, things that leaders can do with vis-a-vis their teams. I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to say, start with yourself. We do know that more senior leadership teams actually show high, higher variability in psychological safety. It kind of makes sense to me. The stakes are higher um, in those levels. And without getting too clinical, I'm going to suggest that at least part of that variability comes from how we manage our personal anxiety. And I'm going to put on my clinical hat for just a second. In anxiety, we tend to overestimate the likelihood of a bad outcome, and we underestimate our ability to cope with it. And in reaction to that, we either get more controlling, perfectionistic, etc., or less frequently at work, although this happens as well, more avoidant. We just sort of push it out of our minds. Think for a second about a leader you've had who gets controlling in the face of anxiety. I saw this at play in a meeting yesterday. It's, it, it happens in organizations. It's a totally mm-hmm. understandable phenomenon. What's the impact then on your willingness to speak up with ideas or lift up failures or come forward with shortfalls? We all say we want that, but I think as we sometimes say in mental health, this overly quoted motto of put your own oxygen mask on first, I think managing your own presence at work as a stable, balanced force that can be supportive of your team, not get too reactive to the issue of the day, not become too anxious about whatever the challenge is. you got to start from there. Once you can do that, you're more able to be the type of leader that can do the the concrete things that I think we all want to be able to do, obviously some concrete things, start small, be consistent, ask people to share and express why input is important, invite colleagues to speak up, invite people to share feedback and show them you're acting on it. Follow back up with them. Come up with, in a one-to-one. Oh, last week you said this. You, you, you shared this. You took some risk, actually, sharing this. I wanted you to know I thought about this, and here's a couple of steps I've taken. Have you thought more about ways we could lift that idea up or change that policy or change that practice? I'd like to support you in that. I mean, that's where you can really build the safety is when people do come forward, we reinforce it. When people aren't able to come forward, we we solicit it, we encourage it, we start small, we're consistent. And I think when it comes with bad news, take a deep breath, try to respond in an appreciative manner that someone is having the courage to speak up. Um, third, I think support leaders. Um, it's not easy to lead. And leaders want to have happy, high-performing teams, and they need tools. I think one tip um, is to promote our EAP tools. We have a suite of tools for leaders that can they can call, discuss challenges with a neutral party who can guide them to insights and resources. I might even suggest that beyond guidance, sometimes what they're getting is a voice on the other end of the phone, which has a little bit of that oxygen mask um, wearing quality. Let's get my own head back on straight, and then I can figure out how I'm going to support my team. And then last, I never miss a chance to advocate that we destigmatize mental illness. At Health Partners, we have partnered with a range of community organizations to build a campaign called Make It Okay. It's makeitokay.org. It's free. It's publicly available. It provides employers ways to educate, inform, create a more supportive environment for people in mental distress. When we do that, that can contribute to the kind of culture that empowers people to seek the care and the support they need, allowing them to be their best selves at work. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Uh, again, very insightful. Um, Dr. Palmer, those were the questions that I did have for you, and I truly want to thank you for taking time to have this great uh, and important conversation. It truly has been a wonderful discussion. Thanks so much for the chance to be here. I've really enjoyed it. It is our pleasure. Now, before we close off, I do also want to highlight workplace options, well-being programs, and trainings through customized programs and a comprehensive global network of credentialed providers and professionals, Workplace Options supports employees to become healthier, 
happier, and more productive at work. Workplace Options also delivers learning events led by professional trainings on topics ranging from managing a multi-generational workplace to managing psychosocial risk in the workplace. For more information on a well-being program or trainings for your organizations, please contact us to learn more by visiting WorkplaceOptions.com or by emailing us at service at WorkplaceOptions.com. You will also find the contact details posted on the podcast page. Once again, thank you all for listening. Until next time, take care.